your miracle could be sitting next to you. Yeah, that's, that's the way the Lord works. That is, yeah, look, don't look at the person you're looking. You've been looking down on them. They could be your miracle waiting to happen. Yes, yes, yes. Well, we bless God for that story. What a, what a great story. Um, and by the way, we're, we're, if you have testimonies, let us know if you'd like to share testimony. I mean, something, God's doing something. Because we believe God is doing miracles in our midst and all kinds of miracles. So don't go without that testimony being recorded, either on video or you're up here. We just need to hear those stories of what God is doing. We glorify God with the word of our testimony, isn't it? Yeah, this is how we defeat the enemy. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So remember, guys, no shame. Stand up. You start feeling even slightly sleepy, just stand up. I will not be offended, I promise. In fact, I'll be very happy. If, if I see you sleeping, I might just shout your name loudly. <laughs> and you think, you think the angel of death has called you or something. <laughs> so so, so don't, don't get tempted. Awesome, awesome. So uh, today we're finishing with this. And then tomorrow is our last day. Uh, tomorrow is when we finish. Imagine. It's been amazing. It's been fun to be together, isn't it? It's so good to be with the family of God. Uh, to be with people we love, to be with people we enjoy, uh, to be refreshed. And what a great thing to do it at the beginning of the year, that we can start the year together. So I really love this. So I want to, like I said, today I'm just doing practical family teachings, uh, teachings that help us begin to understand how to govern ourselves and to govern our groups. And the reason I'm doing it is because you're all leaders, and you need to understand when something happens or how to respond, how to act in the house of God, how to, uh, to, to, to behave around each other. And some of these things may seem basic, but it's very important that we actually say, this is how we do it in our family. Every family has a way that we do it at home like this. So this becomes like, this is how we do it in our house. So I'm going to talk a bit about church discipline. What, just tell your neighbor, what comes to mind when you think of the word church discipline, the phrase church discipline? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Is it a, is it a good feeling? Is it a bad feeling? What, what do you think when you hear church discipline? Um, Yeah? What do you think when you hear that phrase? Okay. And then you can tell your neighbor as well. You can let them tell you. What, what comes to mind? What impression uh, comes to mind? Awesome. Awesome. How many of you, when you hear the word or the phrase church discipline, you get a very warm feeling, very just lovely feeling? You feel so nice. You feel so warmed up. You feel so blessed. Nobody said that. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's sad. Oh, you do. Oh, oh, you do. I love it. That is so awesome. So for you, you feel it's exciting. You get warm feelings. Praise God. You and you are the only two people in the room right now. You and me. <laughs> All right. In, anybody get some really negative feelings? It just feels. Aish. It's like rules. It's like, yeah. It's like just something negative. Anybody seen a case of church discipline that went really bad? Yeah? Let me see, show of hands. Yeah. Anybody experienced church wounds because of church discipline, so-called? All right, quite a few of us. So, so church discipline doesn't often bring feelings of warmth. It doesn't feel, when people hear the word, it just feels uh, draconian. It feels like people are being forced to do something they don't want to do. Even the word discipline for some of us is just a bad word. Uh, it's been overused in negative ways. And so we don't even understand uh, what that has to do with uh, church. It's like church should be a warm place. It's a place of family. It's a place of grace, a place of joy. Um, but how many of you know that a family without discipline is not a happy family? Yeah. It's interesting because it's counterintuitive. You think, if I leave my kids to be everything they want to do and there's no discipline, we never have consequences in the house, we're going to have the warmest house and by the way, some of you started ma your parenting journey like that. Until your kids were two years and you realize that is the worst thing you can ever do. Isn't it? When children are untethered and there are no rules and then there's no discipline in that house, it stops being a warm house. And it's funny because we create our kids and then our kids create us. Because what happens is you release them and they are wild and then they become a nightmare. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. We can't sleep. We can't leave the house. We can't go somewhere with those kids. They just wear us down. They wear me down. Every time I'm with those kids, I even wish I wasn't with them. It's like my life has become defined by them. I might talk to somebody in the house or somebody you know. Okay, you're not nodding too loudly. Or, you know, I'm seeing guys looking like they don't want to say yes. 
But it's true. We all know people like that. And that's, a, that's what happens when there's no discipline. Now, the one thing I began to learn back in the day when we started having our kids and we did lay parenting class, which saved our lives, by the way, is I learned that discipline, it doesn't have to do with punishment. Because whenever I used to hear the word discipline, I thought of punishment. Yeah? How many of you are disciplined in high school? <laughs> discipline was punishment, isn't it? And depending on which school you went, it happened in different ways. But I realized, and I was taught, and it was such a relief for me to understand, discipline has, punishment is the last step that you get to, and it only happens very rarely. But discipline has to do more with training. It has to do with training. And when you train your kids well, you rarely ever have to punish them. In fact, like, I honestly, it was so interesting, because we were taught this class, and by the way, if you haven't done Lair, and you've got kids, you want to invest in it. It was that, if I, if I would say the one thing I've ever done, I've paid for, every class I've ever done, I've paid for that was, has continued to be worth it every year of my life. It's worth it more than my master's degree. Doing that, the results are just stunning. Uh, I brought up my kids, Bila Jasho. Bila Jasho just means without stress. Without stress. Uh, my kids used to sleep at seven o'clock every evening. Bila Jasho. And they did that from when they were babies. Like they knew it was better. Actually, no, it was 6 o'clock. 7 o'clock was when they went to high school. <laughs> no, when they were older primary school. It was just bedtime. And we trained them, and they knew. So we'd come home, have dinner. It's pleasant, and everybody goes to bed. And after they go to bed, mommy and daddy have mommy and daddy time. And we enjoy ourselves. Because our home had Bila Jasho, isn't it? There are some of you who know that that's a rumor when you have kids. And you say, oh, my kids are just hyperactive. Oh, they're just hard to deal with. They're strong-willed. Let me tell you, it has nothing to do with the child. It has everything to do with you. Because as a parent, you didn't understand discipline. I'm, I'm, and I'm not even trying to be harsh here. I'm just saying, I was saved. Somebody saved my life. Honestly, if they didn't save my life, I would not have known that. And so Caro and I, we always say, that's the best class we ever took. And because of that, I mean, our kids knew their boundaries. They stayed in their room the whole night. The next morning, they knew they don't leave their, ho their room before 7 o'clock in the morning. So you wake up as, as early as you want. And our kids, even at three, they'd sit in bed and just sing. <laughs> Father Abraham. You just hear someone sing in their room. But they know you don't come out until the right time. And it was just training. That's called training. So if you understand that, discipline stops being painful or fearful. It becomes joyful. Good, pleasant. Because I can tell you, for Pastor Karen and I, bringing up our kids has been mostly good and pleasant. I say good mostly because when they get to teenage, then you, have to, you need new skills. We have to upgrade our ninja skills because teenagers have their own needs. But even there, there's actually some things we've learned that have really made the journey a lot easier. So, so when I teach you about discipline, I'm not teaching you about, oh, punish, oh, flog. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that church discipline is a process by which the church seeks to lovingly restore believers who have been ensnared by sin. So when you understand that, you realize... There is love in the church, and it's a process. We use love to restore people who've been ensnared by sin. It's a way to restore people back into fellowship. It's a way to restore people who've been snatched by the enemy and to grab them back into the kingdom. It's a loving thing to do. Uh, in Jesus' parable, Luke chapter 15, verse 3 to 8, uh, this is a parable when he talks about the lost sheep and how the, one, the farmer leaves the 99 and goes to look for the one. And he says in verse 8, I tell you in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And so it's a very interesting thing. He's like, you know what? When, when discipline is done well, when that lost person is embraced well, there's rejoicing. Are you, are you seeing that word again? There's rejoicing, enjoyment. It's a fun thing. It's a good thing. It's good and pleasant. So I think that's the thing. First of all, I want to get that part of in, into our minds. I want to remove us from that punishment of high school and get us into a place where it's good and it's pleasant. It's important. When a family has no discipline, it is not a joyful family. It's a stressful family. So what's the purpose of church discipline? What's the purpose of church discipline? Uh, maybe just to keep you awake, I'll ask you to just talk to your neighbors uh, and, and give them one reason each. Just give them a reason. This is how in, in afternoon classes have to be a bit different from morning classes. So, so discuss with neighbor for one second. And don't take long. Uh, what's a, give them one reason and they'll give you the other reason. Purpose of church discipline. 
In fact, I would really help. I'd love PA guys if you could give me a, a couple of mics that we can. Oh, they're here. They're here. All right. So I just need a couple of volunteers to help me walk them around. Yes, yes, yes. OK, so with purpose of church discipline, um, let me just ask uh, somebody on this side. You're, oh, you're on that side? OK, Henry, and then uh, Hypsesi on this side. So OK, just pick a random person, because everybody discussed. Uh, pick Baton. Bato? She looks like she's saying call, she's calling you and you're, you're refusing to see her. <laughs> Purpose of church discipline, Bato? Um, we said it's to basically enforce what you believe. To enforce what you believe. Okay, interesting. Uh huh. On this side. Don't look at their eyes. Just give them the mic. In case they're like. Um, to ensure the church looks like what the Bible describes Christians are supposed to look like. Interesting, yeah. Interesting. There's wow. one here. Oh, okay, I love that. Uh -huh. There's one here. There's one where? Behind. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mavuno. Good afternoon. Oh, that's purity. Uh, I couldn't tell from here. Uh, I think the role of church discipline is to align us to the will, mind, and the heart of God. Wow. And to make us holy. Amen. Just like God. Love it. Okay. You have some people you've paid. They're already clapping before you even finish talking. <laughs> All right. I think we have one more in this side. We'll just take one more from each mic. Oh, which mic went first? Oh, Hen Henry. Uh, pick. They're all looking down. Say, yeah, pick that guy. Yeah, he's looking like he's a good guy. <laughs> In fact, pick the ones who look down. Don't pick the ones who have their hands up. <laughs> um, I believe it's to, to align us to the purpose of God. To align us to the purpose of God. Okay, excellent. Uh huh. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I think it's uh, partly to maintain order to maintain in church. Order. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. The person you paid has clapped. Yeah. <laughs> Success and maturity. Hey. <laughs> I love it. All right. By the way, these are really good answers. So let me tell you the three that I had. The first is spiritual restoration of fallen members. Restoring fallen members. Um, when a person is worn and they, they're in sin... They're in the devil's trap. So you're just snatching them from the devil's snatch, uh, trap, and you're restoring them back to fellowship. So that's the first reason, and I think some of you alluded to that. Number two is the strengthening of the church. You're strengthening the church. When a sinning, a, a sinning believer is rebuked, turns away from sin and is forgiven, the church grows in understanding the dangers of sin, but also the powers of grace. Because when it's done well, grace should be the F effect. The church shouldn't just see there was sin, and it was rebuked. They should also see there was grace that was extended. And they, 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 the church grows when grace is extended. Number three, the glorifying of the Lord. When a sinning believer is rebuked, turns away from sin, and is forgiven, God is glorified by the church and the watching world. Uh, and the watching world gives glory to God as well. Uh, because people have never seen good restoration. People expect punishment. They expect excommunication. They expect all the things... When they see grace, they don't know what that is because the world has no answer for grace. Let me tell you, C.S. Lewis said there's no other faith. There's nobody else in the world who understands what grace is. There's no other doctrine that teaches grace, that God loves you not because of you but because of him and that he forgives you because of what he has, not because of what you have. It's grace, unmerited favor. And when the world sees that, they're like, oh my goodness, we want more of that because we don't understand it. So when it's done well, it glorifies God. Now, the purpose of church discipline is not to throw people out of the church. That's not the purpose. It's not to feed the self-righteous pride of those who are administering the discipline. Because sometimes it can be about, you know, now you're offending our sensibilities. It's not to embarrass people. And it's also not to abuse power, to exercise authority and power in some unbiblical fashion. So that's not the purpose. It's to lovingly restore the sinner, the sinning believer to holiness and restore him back into fellowship with the church. Now, as you lead your discipleship groups, you will find situations 
when you will need to exercise church discipline. And that's why you need to know this. Because every, every one of us, you're leading a family now. Remember we say church is family. So as a parent, you need to actually understand how to restore. Because your children will sin. They will fall. They will make mistakes. They will, they will fall off the faith. What do you do? As a, how do you become that person who leaves the 99 and brings the one back? So let me talk a bit about when church discipline is appropriate. It's not always appropriate. So there's a few conditions for you to apply it. Number one, the person must be a professing believer. The person must be a believer. Uh, church discipline doesn't operate with people who are not saved and who are not Christians. It's, it's a very, so it's interesting. When you become a Christian, you're part of the family of God. And it's just like you don't discipline kids outside your house. You discipline the ones who are inside your house, who are your children. Uh, Paul wrote a letter, um, and he warned the church not to associate with immoral people. And then, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he said, now this letter that Paul had written, by the way, it's, a, it's a, one of the lost letters of Paul. Paul, we have uh, about 16 letters by him in the New Testament, uh, out of the 27 in the new t- books of the, 20, of the New Testament. And they're letters he wrote that we don't know about. So this letter he's quoting about, he says, I wrote to you in my letter, go back to, yeah, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. He had written to them about that. But people misunderstood, they got it twisted. He said, not, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave the world. It's kind of funny, isn't it? It's like, if you're judging people around you for being who they're supposed to be, you'd have to leave the world. Because when you see somebody who doesn't have Christ and they're being immoral, why is that your business? That's their nature. That's who they are. When somebody comes and is sleeping with someone's wife and they're not a believer, that's the nature of the kingdom you're part of. I really can't help that person. But if they're in the kingdom, it's a different thing. And that's why he says, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, or slanderer, a drunkard, or swindler, do not even eat with such people. That's a really tough thing for him to say. And he says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? So the world is always like, don't judge me. Like judging isn't good. Amen? Paul says, I agree, it is not good. But when it's your child who is taking drugs, judge them. You'll be a very foolish parent to say, oh, I can't judge you. Your choice. Ah, where? You're a sinner. You go to hell. Your child is dying. You do what it takes to take them out of that place, isn't it? You, if, whatever you have to do, you will do it as a parent. So Paul is like, yeah, yeah, we don't judge people outside the church. But inside the church, this is a family. We have to judge. And not, judging doesn't mean that we look down on you, but it means that we actually say this is wrong. This is actually not right. A believer does not operate this way. God's business is to judge those outside the church. That's God's work. But for us inside the church, he says it's the church's responsibility to judge those within the church. And by the church, he's not talking about an institution. He's talking about the people of God. It is the role of the people of God to ensure that they're speaking truth in love to one another. Our first step is to be able to make sure that this person actually has accepted Christ. They understand the gospel. Because you may be trying to rebuke somebody who who is not born again. And they, therefore, you have, no, you have no business doing that. Number two, this person must be part of our church. They must be part of our church. Uh, if, they're in our ch- if they come to our church, um, if, they're in, if, if they're in your discipleship group, then they're in your church. It doesn't matter where they say they go to church because they have joined deliberately knowing that they're being discipled. Uh, if they serve in one of our ministries, they're an associate. If they're one of our pastors, any one of our leaders, then they are part of our church. If there are a visitor from another church who just walked in and was happening to be there with us on Sunday and we know that, that they're living in sin, that's not my business either. Yeah. They come. At Mavuno, we say, come as you are. Come as you are. I won't tell you, you're an elder from another church, you're living in sin, come and we dis-. I'm like, what business do I have? My job is to show you grace and show you love until you realize the way I'm living is not right, just like an unbeliever. But if you belong to this family, then I need to tell you that's not right. So when it comes to a member of the family, the role is to, we need to ask people to live according to the calling that God has called them to. Ephesians chapter 4 says that. Uh, He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Oh, come on, you've received a calling. Remember, we said we've all received callings. Everyone in this house has a calling. By the way, is anybody doubting their calling anymore? You are called, people are doubting. 
I preached the sermon of Wednesday again. It's like, we are all called. We're all called. So, he's saying, live a life worthy of this calling. Jesus has called you. He's given his life on the cross to call you. So, live a life worthy of the calling. Number three, the person must be knowingly and defiantly disobedient. So, by the time I'm, asking, I'm talking about church discipline, this person has actually, you can tell, they're doing something defiant, they're doing something continuously, they're, knowing, they're doing it knowingly. It's not somebody who just stumbled into it uh, because of their maturity, they didn't even know it was wrong. And I found them with a bottle somewhere, uh, and they are tipsy. And I know the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine. But you know what? Hey, you didn't know. So one of the, one of the uh, thing is, um, one of the, the really great instructions we learned in our, when we were, this one I think we learned not from Leah, but from our b- bishop, Bishop Oscar, is he taught me never to discipline a child, never to give consequences to a child, if I never told them it was wrong. So if I found my child with sugar stuffed on their mouth, and I said, who, 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 where, who ate the sugar? And they say, it wasn't me. And the sugar is dripping. I don't discipline them. I don't, I don't, there are no consequences because I've not told you that. But I'll sit with you and say, hey, listen, in our house, lying is wrong. Forget even sugar first. Let's first go to the lying. We don't lie in this house. Lying is telling something that's not truth, and I give you instruction about that. Now, next time you lie, there will be consequences. So even, by the way, even when our kids are older, we don't, we never give consequences if they never knew, or if we never instructed. By the way, sometimes I'm like, they should know, but I didn't instruct. So I want to make sure that you're violating an instruction that should be known. So if I find an immature believer who just didn't know that they're not supposed to go to the pub when they got saved and and take a few drinks before they go home, first I... I instruct them, isn't it? I tell them, guys, this is why this is wrong. Let's look at the scripture. This is why you don't do this. And then after that, you can actually talk about the case of discipline. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, very interesting scripture. It says, we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Just keep that verse up because it's a very interesting verse. Brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, Encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. It's very interesting because it's telling you, don't mix up your audiences. Don't mix up the audiences. Don't encourage the disruptive. Warn them. If somebody's just being disruptive, that's not the time to come and say, oh, brother, I know, you're just not happy. That's why you're disrupting the... Uh, 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 Warn. warn. This one is a warning because they know what they're doing. But then it also says, you, it doesn't say admonish the weak. <laughs> it doesn't say warn the weak. It says help the weak, isn't it? This one is weak. What they need is not warning. They need help. So there's a way that Paul is saying, understand. Use the mind to understand what you do in each situation. Because not everybody is a place where they need discipline. Some people need actually conversation and to be able to be helped. Sometimes a new believer is in sin because of ignorance. They didn't know. They're weak. Help them. But there are other times when you just know this person is defiant. They know and they're still doing it. And at that point, the Bible says they've become disruptive. So then at that point, what you do is you admonish them and you warn them. So for me, it's interesting because if I found my, when my three-year-old was was acting like a three-year-old, if I found them acting, I don't discipline you for for being three. (laughs) Three Three-year-olds have certain peculiar behaviors. That is, it goes with every three-year-old. I don't, dis- I don't admonish you. I don't, I don't uh, discipline you. I don't even challenge you for being three. That's who you are. When they're defiant, however, then I have to discipline them. And let me tell you something. When children are even two, three years, they understand defiance. They know. And many times parents are like, oh, sweet angel. No, 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 no. They're not an angel. They're a sinner. And that sin has to be dealt with very early. Or it will, con- it will corrupt their hearts. So you deal with it. But if I find you just doing what foolish three-year-olds do, they ran and then they knocked over a vase. And nobody had even told you, don't run. Seriously, that's what three-year-olds do. I clean up the vase, we sit down, and then I train you. And then training now helps you now understand there's a higher standard. So if, 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 I, if I find a new believer who's overcome by a sin, but is repentant, or even an older believer, but they're repentant, they want help, at that point, I help them. They really do want to be helped. And I say, okay, what do we do? Do we get you into rehab? 
Do we walk with you? Do we get you a counselor? Do we get you into marriage counseling? Because you're asking for help. You're, there's a repentance there. But if I find a person saying, I have a right to do what I choose, who are you to even ask me questions? Already, that's, they're showing defiance, and they need a stronger warning. They need a stronger confrontation. Are you understanding? So it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't just jump at things, and this person is doing wrong, this person is doing wrong. You understand where they are. And then number four, the person must be disobeying clear commands of Scripture. It's easy for us to set up our own rules and then to start taking people through church discipline for our rules. That's when you start cults. We're talking about the rules in Scripture. There are things in Scripture that are, 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 are commanded in Scriptures. So, so <sighs> drinking wine is not a Scripture. There's no admonition against it in the Bible. And I know you came from different church backgrounds, but there's no verse that says you can't drink wine. But there is a verse against drunkenness. Those two are very different situations. Now, I usually, when I'm discipling somebody, I'll tell them why I don't drink wine. It's not because I can't drink wine or I don't like wine. It's because at one point, I realized that God has bought me for himself so much and I want to be so completely sold out to Jesus. I never want to have an option. When I get depressed, because I will, I mean, when you're in the Lord, things can happen. You can have an accident. You can lose a loved one. You can find out you've, something you've gone through that has taken you to the depths. And what happens when people go to the depths is that they go for comfort. The thing that they've learned to, to comfort themselves with. If it is binge watching TV, that's what they'll do. If it is drinking alcohol, that's what they'll do. And so a very, I don't know, as a young Christian, the way I was discipled is, let nothing ever master you. That's the way I was discipled. And so I realized, I like, I like wine. It's really pleasant. But then I also realized, I'm that guy who the day things go wrong. I might find myself seeking solace in this. And so I just stopped. That was a personal conviction. It's not in the scripture. But I say to myself, let nothing ever master you except Jesus. That's my rule for myself, by the way. Now, I teach them that because I pray that they can make that a rule for themselves and make their own decisions based on that rule because we all know the things that master us, isn't it? So when I tell you I don't watch TV series, it's because I know I'm that gay. In fact, my wife knows. My wife can start the most exciting TV series and then she gets sleepy and she's like, ah, and she goes to bed. I'm that guy, in the middle of an exciting movie, even if it's late and I'm preaching tomorrow, I have to finish the movie. I have to. I'm just, I can't sleep without knowing how it ends, especially if it's a good movie. I can't. Is anybody in the house like me? I just can't. I'm like, it's one o'clock, but you just go to bed. I have to watch this thing. So I'd rather just not start. I'm that guy who just knows. Panza TV series, let me just tell you, if I get into an exciting TV series and it's this season of my life, I'll be running from this meeting to go and watch 15 some episode somewhere. I'm that guy. So because I know my weakness, I'm like, I don't watch TV series. The only time I'll ever watch a TV series is if I'm on leave. And even then, I really try not to. Because there's no ending to those things. And you know how they leave cliffhangers? You're like, ah, let me just finish. It's uh, five minutes and then it's over. Then you just, <laughs> you're like, what happens next? Ah! It's already two o'clock at night and I'm watching the next one. I'm on season two. <laughs> So I'm like, this thing was designed to be addictive. I know myself. I'm just not going to let nothing master you. So what is the thing that masters you? It may not be what masters other people. But knowing yourself, put that list. So, so when it comes to, to, to discipline, however, we're not looking for those things. We're looking for the things that are clear violations of God's scriptural principles. I talked about money, sex, and power today. And that begins to already show you things where people will violate the rules of God. And you can tell when somebody's violating those rules. But the... The, generally, there's different kinds of places where the Bible speaks about. The Bible has many lists of the acts of the flesh. One of them is, and one of the most serious, is violations of God's moral commandments. There are those moral commandments. Thou shalt not steal. You shall not kill. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Those, those are moral commandments. Uh, if I find somebody having sex with somebody who's not their wife, that already is. There's no debate. That's just a moral. You're breaking God's rule. God said you shall not. And many of the money, sex, power things usually fall within that bracket. Huh? But violations of God's moral commands. The second one is relational sins. Paul talks a lot about those relational sins. Um, things like gossip, slander, anger, abusive speech, uh, fits of rage. All those fall within that space. So again, that's another area where if you see a Christian who's given to those things and they're always having anger bursts, outbursts, then it, as a disciple, you start to say, that's an issue that we need to confront. And it might be as good as a conversation and accountability, or but at a certain point, we might have to 
uh, escalate things if things are not changing. Uh, number three is divisiveness in the church. Divisiveness in the church. Um, this is a <laughs> divisiveness in the church is a major issue. Strife is a spirit. I think I talked about it in November. There's a spirit called strife. And that spirit delights in breaking up. And some people, by the way, operate with the spirit of strife. Huh? They come into your discipleship group. The minute they join in the WhatsApp, they already start questioning what the leader is saying. And it's not that they're questioning in a good way of, oh, please help me ex explain that. I don't understand. It's those ones of, and who said that? Why is it that that opinion is correct? How do we know the pastor is? I mean, you can already tell they're not questioning in a positive way. It's almost like a divisive way. And then whenever they enter a group, camps start forming. Do you know any people like that? Me, I know people like that. And those, I mean, you're going to read, there's some incredible scriptures about that that just talk about, hey, you need to confront. In your group, if you have a divisive person, you need to have that conversation early. Otherwise, they'll break it. If you're in your church, if you have a disruptive person, you need to have that conversation early. Otherwise, they'll disrupt your church. Uh, maybe I can give you a few scriptures on that one. You can read about them later. Uh, Romans 16, 17 to 18. Uh, just write them down. I'm not going to, I don't have time to read them all. Uh, Romans 16, 17 to 18. Titus 3, 10. And then 3 John 9 and 10. Those are great scriptures just about divisive people. 3 John 9 and 10. Titus 3, 10. So those are the scriptures there. Just, I just thought I'll throw those in because many people don't understand the dangers of divisiveness. Uh, divisiveness is one of the ways the devil splits. I've seen the devil split fellowships. I've seen the devil split churches. I've seen him split families through divisive people, the spirit of strife. Number four, false teaching on major doctrines. This, that's, that's an issue you have to confront. When somebody starts to teach Jesus Christ is not God, is not Lord, that's, that's a major doctrine. That's not something we even discuss in this church. <laughs> if you don't believe that, we don't believe you're a Christian. Uh, there, there's some things there that are just, salvation is by grace alone. Somebody starts teaching works, and that you have to do this to earn God's approval, immediately I'm on you. Boom. You're not going to teach that in our church. Uh, go find another family if you can't teach that. I mean, we don't teach that here. We don't practice that here. And so being, be, being able to understand the key things. Uh, Jesus died for your sins. Key doctrine. Those are things that we don't mess around with here. We believe that 100%. The Holy Spirit is alive and exists today, and He gives spirit, gifts to His people. For us, that's an unnegotiable. He is. Read our statement of faith and you see what are some of those major things where we say we don't mess around with these major doctrines. Number five, this, <laughs> this one's an interesting one. Disorderly conduct and refusal to work. Disorderly conduct and refusal to work. As a disciple, as a disciple uh, leader, disciple group leader, you actually have the authority and you need to actually confront that person who's refusing to work. They're not, they're not interested in working. They just want to sponge off other people. They just want to be comfortable, and they're lazy, and they won't take just any opportunity that comes up. They'd rather sit in the house. Um, and I'll give you a couple of scriptures. Let me give you a couple of scriptures for that one. Um, let me see, okay. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6 to 15. I'm giving you the ones that are not as obvious. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 15, and then 1 Timothy 5, 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8. So... Those are just some verses. So those, those are the areas that we discipline in. When you start to see violations in these areas, then as a discipleship group leader, your radar is up, and you're like, we're going to have to have a conversation. Something has to happen. Discipline has to happen uh, in this. So let's talk about the process of discipline. That's what I want to know. That's an important part for me. What do you do when you find somebody is in sin? A, a wife in your group comes and tells you, my husband is, uh, I know he's a leader in your group, but he's sleeping with somebody. Uh, He's, he's abusing our daughter. Uh, when you find uh, that, that um, this guy, uh, he's embezzled, he's in your group, but he's, he's, a, he's a corrupt government official, and people come and tell you this guy is actually stealing money. Uh, what, what do you do when this person is, is getting drunk every night and nobody knows, but some, you discover that now they, they, they're just, they drink themselves to sleep, they're drunk? What do you do in those situations when you find that this person is... I mean, there, there are so many situations that will happen for you in a group. Uh, and you, you start to ask, what do you do in that situation? Uh, Matthew, 8, M Matthew 18, verse 15, is the best model. And I've used this model many, many times. And I just find it such a useful model. This, by the way, is not just for your discipleship group. It's true for any Christian who wrongs you. If somebody borrows money all the time and they never return it, that's 
That's just, it's a bad reputation for the church. Somebody needs to confront that. So how do you deal with that when you find somebody? It says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Step one, have a conversation. Now, this one, you don't involve anybody. You don't take, you just go and have a friendly conversation and say, what you're doing is hurting me. What you're doing is not right. And let me explain what, that, what I mean by that. Now, in this conversation, you're not going to shame them. You're not going to fight. You're simply going to express. Because I always say, give people an opportunity. Sometimes you'll be surprised. They were not thinking about you. I remember one time I preached in a church and I made a few examples and I was like over here. And somebody wrote me a very hot email and said, I'm, I'm not even into your church anymore. How dare you? You came to our campus and you just preached about me. The whole time, I could tell when you're giving that example, you kept looking at me. <laughs> I was like, I was like, and they had left. By the way, they're not giving me a chance to answer. They're like, this is where I've left your church and I've gone. Last scene heading. And I'm like, really? You took offense, but you didn't give me a chance. I was not even thinking about I didn't even realize you were in church that day. I didn't see her. You know, sometimes as a preacher, you think I'm looking at you, but I'm being blinded by these my things. Eh? So you can think I'm looking at you and I don't even have a clue you're in the room. But this person is offended. They didn't give me a chance to defend. And this happens all the time. It happens in marriage. It happens in relationships and friendships. How could they say that? What did they think? They weren't thinking. They didn't even know you were offended. And sometimes what happens is you're like, they should have known better. Oh my gosh. Let me just say this. Husbands, your wife is not a mind reader. She isn't. And vice versa. Your, your husband is not a mind reader. He doesn't know until you say it. So the first thing is to just go and say, by the way, when you say this, it really cut me deep. It really hurt me. Step. That's what you do. But then he says, um, verse 16, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that, in, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And then verse 17, it says, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So he's giving us four steps. He's giving us uh, uh, four steps in what we do over here. And it's very interesting because in, in verse 15, he actually says, when you talk to them one-on-one -on -one and they listen to you and they repent, you've won them over. You've won them over. This is the point of restoration, to win someone over. Uh, the, the Greek word for won, that won them over, it actually uh, is used originally in the sense of accumulating wealth. You've won wealth. So what this is saying is when you win a brother over, when you win a sister over, you've, you've actually won wealth. You've actually won riches. It's a huge thing you've done. It's like, a, it's like becoming richer. You've created wealth for yourself, wealth for the kingdom. Something that was valuable, that was lost, is now found. And when a sister or valuable, or sister, a brother or sister strays, a valuable treasure is about to be lost to the church. So you, you win them through your confrontation. And in the body of Christ, that's what we must be about, is recovering those who are lost, isn't it? The Son of Man came to seek and save who are lost. So give me a chance. When I preach and I'm looking at you, just come and tell me, Pasi, do you have beef with me? Because you used me three times in a sermon illustration. Did you realize? And I'm like, oh, first of all, I will confess what you've done because I didn't even think about you when I was talking. It's like, come and talk to me because you don't know. And guess what? I, here's my, this is actually, I, I say this all the time to my team. Always throw a rope to people. When they throw you, when they hurt you, throw them a rope. Because what has happened is they've climbed into a hole. And they have two choices. They'll either climb out, and climbing out is repentance and saying, I'm so sorry, I didn't even know your heart. Or saying, I promise you had nothing, I, I, had, I was not thinking about you. They've climbed out of the hole that you had put them in, isn't it? Or number two, they'll hang themselves with a the rope. Which is when they tell you, ah, in fact I meant it, you useless person. Then you're like, okay, I wasn't reading my own things, it's true. Now I'm not here on hearsay. It's actually the truth, isn't it? But now I can actually take action knowing I know what you did and you know what you did. Too much mind reading doesn't help. Let me say this, ladies. You're, you have many senses, many more senses than we do. Us guys only have six senses. No, actually five. We only have five senses. Ladies have like 13 or 15, I'm sure. 
you sense things. You feel things. That's why when ladies are together, they can look at somebody and they're having a fun time and then somebody tells you, those chicks hate each other. And you're like, how did you know? Ah, you can't see how they'll look at each other. I'm like, I thought we, all, we both used two eyes. How did you see? It's because women don't just see, they sense. And that's one of the biggest problems in marriage is that you think your husband also has 13 senses. And so they say something and you're like, how dare he? And I'm like, the poor guy was just commenting that the food was cold. He has not, it has nothing to do with you and the relationship. <laughs> Somebody's putting himself in trouble right now. <laughs> don't say amen too loudly and she's sitting next to you. You might be punched. <laughs> so, so don't fill in for him. Let him tell you. So, so sweetie, it sounds like you're offended. And the guy will be like, because he's a smart guy, he'll be like, backtrack quickly. Oh, no, 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 I'm not offended. I'm not offended. I was just saying the food is cool. I'll take it to the microwave. Thank you. <laughs> if he's a smart husband, that's what he'll do. So, but don't assume he was insulting you. Don't assume he was, he was putting you down. And many times as Christians, we do that. We make assumptions. Somebody does something. Yes, it hurts you. But maybe they had no intention of doing that. So, so, so in, uh, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 17, Jesus gives us four steps. Uh, the first step is Matthew 18, 15. Point out the fault just between the two of you. So step one, we're moving to step one. Point out the fault just between the two of you. Now here what happens is an individual believer goes to a sinning brother privately. You're not trying to shame. And I don't even gossip about it. I don't tell people in my prayer group, pray guys, this guy has really offended me. I need you guys to pray because God is going, mm -mm, that's gossip. I don't talk about it before I've talked to you because I, want, I might talk about it change people's idea about you, and then at the end when I come back, nothing happened, and we resolve. And this happens all the time, by the way. Let me say, this is one of the reasons why in our team, I challenge my, my, my team. I say, never talk to your spouse about something that happened to you at work before you are sure about it. Because, or, or even before you've resolved it, you've done your Matthew 18 process. Because what's going to happen, Pastor James and I have an argument, and, or not even an argument. I say something to him and I say, Pastor James, I'm very disappointed you did this and you did this and I'm not happy with you. And I think I want you to do it again. And maybe that day he was having a rough day and he's just like, Pastor M has just, doesn't even know what's going on. And he goes and he tells Pastor Docas, you can't even believe how, how rough this guy was. I can't even understand what he was smoking. It's like he hates me. It's like he just, he's just blowing up on all of us. And then, Pastor Docas being a good wife, she takes her husband's side, isn't it? She should. And she's like, sweetie, I'm so sorry that happened. I can't imagine that guy did that. Why would he attack our family like that? And women can be mother bears. When your husband's under attack, he's like, I can't believe that pastor did that. I don't like that. In fact, I knew that. So then the next day, this is actually what happened. The next day, Pastor James and I are talking, and Pastor James being the guy is like, by the way, yesterday you really hurt. I mean, it's like, what was up? I, I, did you really mean what you said? I'm like, Jemo, how? I didn't even think about that. I'm so sorry. I didn't even get what you were going through. And Jemo is like, okay, we're boys. So we're boys. Hug. Guy hug. Done. Guess what happens? Jemo goes home and forgets to tell his wife that Pastor M and he, Pastor M was not even thinking about him when he said those words. He was even talking about someone else. So the next day I come, oh, Pastor Dorcas, my daughter, good to see you. And she's like, So guess what he's just done? He's just cut off his wife from her spiritual authority. He's destroyed her faith. Because now she's an independent Christian who has no spiritual father. But him, he's moved on. So that's, that's the danger of even discussing with your spouse before you've done step one. Because many times the person close to you will take your side. And later you'll probably not even be able to tell them how relieved you are and how intense it was that you were. You're, they were not there to hear the sincerity, and they're protective of you. So the first thing I do is I'm like, okay, before I even talk, tell Carol what's happening, let me go and have a conversation with this person. Let me give them a chance. I'm going to throw a rope and see what happens. And uh, at that point, I ask the right questions. Like, when you say this, what did you mean? I'm not telling them. I first want to hear what, Rocky, what did you mean when you say this to me? And if, say, for instance, it's somebody in my discipleship group who is, I've heard is sleeping around, or I know was sleeping around, I'm like, okay, so what's the let's talk. I really want to understand about this woman that you're seeing. What's the problem? Do you see a problem with what you're doing? Because I want them to understand that there's a problem. I don't even want to tell them there's a problem. Because it's easy to go with your Bible. 
dude, what's up with you? I'm already telling you what the problem is. What, what, do you, what happens when you do that? You shut the door. They get defensive. So I'm like, okay, tell me what's going on. What's happening? Why are you doing this? And the person explains, oh, I no longer feel for my wife. I don't even know what's happening. Uh, like, she doesn't do it for me anymore. I hear this all the time, by the way. I can't tell you the stories. It's like, when we got married, it was like she was always available. Now it's just like, so I said, okay, let me ask you the question. What's the problem? What's the real problem? What's the, what do you think is the problem with what you're doing? Uh, what do you mean there's a problem? It's not my fault. Uh, it's her fault. No, no, no. I hear you, and I understand what you've just said. But what do you think could be a problem with what you're doing, the action you're doing? What do you think could, it could cause? May I'll be happy. No, 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 I agree. <laughs> but, 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 but maybe we need to think a bit broader. You know? And I'm here to help you, by the way. I'm not here to condemn you. What do you think the problem could be? What do you think could be some of the consequences of what you're doing? Oh, yeah, I know. I could mess my marriage. Okay, all right, so you see that. Do you think there could be other challenges? Uh, well, my kids. I guess we have kids. We have to figure out what to do with them. All right, all right. Tell, let's, let's keep going. What, what other consequences do you think this could have? It's like, well, our parents will be offended. Yeah, my parents. So I'm, I'm just helping you begin to see what you're doing, isn't it? I'm not telling you, guy, your children. You're, I want you to see it yourself. So it means I'm having a real conversation with you. I'm not, I'm not telling you, I'm asking you. And I'm doing it with love. And I'm going between us and I'm saying, guy, guy, let's talk. Let's reason. The Lord says, come, let's reason together. I want you to understand what this could be. And then I say, so if that happens to your kids, what do you think will happen? What do you think the future is? And then I say, how would you stop that from happening? What do you think, what is the most important thing you can do right now to stop all those crazy consequences? I'm helping you figure out. And you're like, yeah, maybe, maybe I need to go and talk to their mom. Maybe we need to resolve this thing. Maybe we need to see a counselor. Wow. I've just won him over. I've just helped somebody begin to see for themselves. It's their solution, isn't it? So it's, discipline is not going and telling you you're a sinner. It's saying, let's talk. Let's reason. I want to win you over. My attitude is the, an attitude of love. It's an attitude of grace because it comes from the fact that I know I'm a sinner too. In fact, in the same position as you, I might feel the same way. But let's talk about what is happening. What is actually the real problem? And what are the consequences that problem could cause? Um, now, if this person hears me in that process and they accept responsibility, then I can help them take the next steps. If it's talking to their wife, if it's figuring out some counseling, if it's seeing the pastor to resolve the issue, I've won them over. I've won them over. If it's even making a confession to the people that they've hurt in this decision, I've, I've won them over. And discipline has been, the, the brother is restored. Step one worked. We don't have to go to step two. And so that's, that's the first thing. So I want to say this. When you see somebody doing that, give them a chance. Let them explain themselves and then help them see. Help them ask them the questions that will help them see what are the challenges in what they're doing. Because many times people don't understand what I'm doing when I'm sleeping with this woman is number one, I'm creating soul ties. Number two, I'm destroying a marriage. Number three, I'm destroying those. Don't believe anything the psychologists tell you. Divorce is horrible for children. You're messing up the lives of your children. Number four, you're messing up an extended family. We are Africans. I mean, how, how many extended families can a man have? You're destroying all these families and destroying many relationships and being a bad example to many, many children. I mean, there's so much you're causing. And then number three, number six, is you have issues that are causing you to be unfaithful to your wife. And if you don't deal with those issues, guess what? You're going to, who, who the next person you're going to be unfaithful to? It, there's so many consequences. But sometimes people jump into it because their feelings are telling them it's the right thing to do. And so helping them be able to process is a very good step in that first step. But now you move to step two. If this person, after you've had that conversation, uh, does not listen, then step two tells you, Matthew 18, 16, if they don't listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So if this person has refused to listen, you've, you've tried to be civil, you've tried to be uh, loving, you've tried to be gracious, but you can tell, mm -mm, you're not changing my mind. I'm not leaving this person. Uh, you do what you want. Then what I do is I take other believers to confront. And the reason I want to do that is the Bible tells us that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three. We don't want it to be in the place where I misunderstood what this person was saying. That maybe it's me who has my own issues. 
that cause me to mishear what they're saying. I want to make sure that other people are there so that there's counsel from other believers. At that point, I might take their discipleship group leader with me. I might even take their pastor with me and say, hey, I need you to help me do this. At that point, it's not gossip because I've had my conversation. If you just came to me and told me, Pastor, I'm, guess what your church member is doing? Already I'm like, dude, don't tell me. That's gossip. Uh, have you confronted them first? I, used to, I learned that from uh, Pastor B, Pastor Oscar's wife. She's one of the most honest people I've ever met. Painfully honest. And she's that person who you come and say, hey, 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 Kwanzaa, these guys, have you even heard what they're doing? The first question she'll say is, okay, before we get into gossip, have you talked to them about it? You know how you're trying to be, fr- you know how you're trying to be warm with someone? Mike, have you heard what guys are doing? She's like, before you, before you drag me into gossip, have you talked to them? She, she's, she's blunt like that. She did that to me once. I was like, never again. No more gossip in Jesus' name. Before I talk to you, let me have talked to them first. But now I've talked to them, so I can actually come and say, I've confronted them, I've failed, I think I need help. And together, we go and say, we need to win this brother over. We pray, and we go and see the person. And hopefully they'll agree to see us. And this is a protection for the one being approached, because I don't want to misjudge them. But it's also a protection for me, because I also don't want to be at the place where I'm the one who's not understanding. I don't want to be biased. Because when someone is biased, then they can give a different um, uh, a judgment. So, the witness comes to confirm whether this person will listen. Maybe when they see the escalation, they'll be like, hey, okay, you brought Pastor James. <laughs> okay, let's just talk, you know. Or you brought my discipleship group leader. Okay, fine, let's hear you guys. And maybe there's now more witness. There's more ability to work together, to love on this person together. We're concerted. We're praying as someone is talking. And hopefully, remember, our, our one intention is to win this person over and to bless the body of Christ and to glorify God. That's the only reason we're having this conversation. So we, 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 hopefully this step will work, and they'll say, you know, when this guy came, I didn't get it. I was very defensive, but since the time he came, and now you guys are come, I just feel so burdened. Yanni, you guys are so right. Let me tell you that these are the things you pray will happen. Like, yeah, Pasi, I'm going to change. Any pastor just goes, Jesus, thank you. My work is so easy. It's, it's rarely that easy, but it, it, it can happen. It does happen. Step three, sinning brother refuses to respond, and there's something that happens next uh, because it says now is a place for you to either talk, bring them to the church. It says bring them to the church and then uh, basically what, what does that mean? It means that you bring the matter to the church authorities. This is where probably you bring him to Pastor James. This is probably where you say, okay, now we've tried as a DG to talk to this guy. We've tried as an MC to talk to this guy, but now we're just going to have to bring it to Pastor James and to say this guy is our discipleship group leader and he is just living a life that completely is breaking God's law. Now, Pastor James, being a, a good father, he's not going to let his children's faith be destroyed because guess what happened? The consequence of that DG group leader who is sleep, sleeping with someone else's wife is a destruction of the faith of all the sheep there. And Pastor James, as a good shepherd, knows the, 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 the lives of those sheep is too precious. This guy, he, we tried to rescue him, we've tried to have the conversation, and he's not hearing it. So now what Pastor James says is he brings this affair. This issue is brought to the leaders of the church. And the leaders have one more attempt. It might even be an attempt where we're saying, okay, we're going to send a team to sit with this person and talk to them. The pastor is going to, con- to confront them and say, listen, this is important. You have to hear it. We're moving past the place of now just, hey, please listen, to the place of now you need to listen. Because if you don't, there will be consequences. And those consequences are not the consequences we would ever want to give. Of course, it's still done lovingly. Now, the idea is to hopefully... Uh, pursue the person aggressively and plead with them to repent before the fourth step becomes necessary. Step four is the last one, which talks about removing this person from fellowship. Removing this person from fellowship. Uh, Jesus said, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax gatherer. Uh, the word Gentile was used by Jews, um, and they, 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 they looked at people who held on to paganism as just, they're just sinners. They're just people who are far from God's grace. And they, they had no part of co- the covenant. They had no part of worship. They were not part of the community. A tax gatherer was a person who was a traitor to his own people. A person who was tax collector. He worked for the Romans against his own people. So he's saying, treat them like somebody who has chosen to be a traitor to the cause of God. Now, this doesn't mean I insult them. It doesn't mean that I harshly embarrass them. It doesn't mean any of those things. But it does mean that at that point, then you say, you've opted to remove yourself from the fellowship. Again, it sounds very harsh. What business do you have? And let me tell you what, if your church has a horizontal relationship and we're all equal, then I have no business doing that. 
But if the Lord has appointed spiritual leaders, who he will hold accountable for the sheep, then when those spiritual leaders do not take that step, they will be held accountable for the lives of the people who will be lost. And so I need to understand, it's, not even a, it's, it's bigger than just this person's life. It's, I will be held accountable. Because if I let you continue to serve, and you are an adulterer, and a serial adulterer, defiant, then what am I doing? I'm teaching all the people under you that that's okay. And guess what? I'm destroying them as well. I will be held accountable for their lives. So step number four then becomes very necessary. And we say, you, please, you're not welcome to the discipleship group. And even Sunday, we, we're actually saying, now we're going to treat you like a sinner. By the way, sinners are welcome in Mavuno. So you can come and sit, but we're not going to chase you from sitting in here. But you will not be seen as a part of the body. You will not be seen as a part of the body. Now, that sounds really harsh, guys. But again, remember the important thing. Now, let me say this. We, there's a policy that we have. And one of the policies we have is when it comes to a sin that destroys the lives of others, it's always better for that sin to come out from you than from the press or from the gossip grapevine. So if, if I was to be found, let's, let's start with a discipleship group leader. If a discipleship group leader had an affair and he repented of that affair, I would say to him, if I was the one counseling him and helping him, I'd say to him, I need you to make a confession to your discipleship group. Why is that important? Because these are the people who follow you. These are the people who, if ever that story came out, you'd have two options, either to lie about it which is even worse because then if that lie is also discovered, you finish them. Or to admit it and then to say, I've been living a double life, guys. I've been doing things I tell you not to do, and here I am. So I tell them the best thing you can ever do is be vulnerable to your group and say, guys, I'm so sorry I messed up. And guys, I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. This is going to hurt you greatly. This, is, this might hurt your faith, and I'm so sorry I did that. And you know, I remember when I was in college, one of my discipleship group leaders, my first discipleship group leader, leader ever, he joined a cult. It almost killed me. Like, this guy is a guy who was discipling me, bringing me to the Lord, and then he joined this cult that was completely, praise God, he finally repented and came back into the fellowship. But I remember for a while, I was lost. I was like, if that guy can join these guys who I know are not biblical, like, it even killed my, ability, my, my willingness to go, to go serve in church. That's how dangerous, that's how the, my role is important for those I'm leading. And so it's important for that person, I'd say to him, it's so good for you. When you do that, number one, you're showing them two things. Number one, you're showing them that we all sin. And you're showing them when you sin, you confess. Because the Bible says confess to one another and be healed. And number three, we're going to teach them grace. Because once you confess, then I'm going to model for them how you forgive. And because what I want them to be able to do as your disciples is to be able to say, wait, you've hurt us, it's true, and cry if they have to because of the pain they'll feel, but then to be able to say, thank you for asking us to forgive, we forgive you. Now, again, some of you came from families where saying I sinned is shaming yourself. In fact, if you ever admitted wrong, you are slammed, you are ostracized, you are hurt, and so many times you are just like, defend yourself at all costs. Never ever admit you're wrong. It's like insurance, never take liability, admit liability. It's like let, let other people decide for you, but you never say you're wrong. But that's not biblical. And in the church, we are the family of God. We're not just any family. Our role is to dispense grace. So there's no sinner who will ever come and say, I'm sorry, I messed up. And the church will say, we don't care, bounce. That will never happen. If we do that, we're not the church of Jesus. Because Jesus talks about what? He talks about that guy who was forgiven a small debt, no, a big debt, and then his servant had an, a smaller debt, and then he cast him out. And for me, as a pastor, if I was to say I can't forgive you, I'd be happy to think about what has Jesus died on the cross for me for? What are the sins that I committed? Even the attitude of my heart. By the way, sometimes sin is not that action. He slept with someone. My sin could be that I am jealous, that I'm greedy, that I love money, and you don't even see it as a pastor because those are the respectable sins. And those things are defiling, just as defiling as any sin. And so when somebody confesses, it is our duty to show grace. It's our duty to say, we forgive you, we accept you. And at that point, I might tell the leader, why don't you do this? Take a break from leading the group for the next few months, and we're going to walk with you a journey of reconciliation, and we will restore you. And for me, my, jo my job is always, I want to restore you back to leadership. 
I want to restore you back into fellowship and to leadership. That's my role as your leader. Now, if you're an MC leader who leads several discipleship groups, because your responsibility is higher, I'll probably ask you to call a meeting of all the discipleship groups and make your confession there. Because remember, you're trying to make your confession with the people who will be greatly hurt if they ever discover this from anybody except you. Which means if you're a zonal leader and you do that, then chances are we'll do a zonal meeting and call them. If you're a campus pastor, we'll do it in church. You stand here on the pulpit, and we've done this at Mavuno, and you confess and say, guys, I've messed up. And I can tell you, every time that's ever happened at Mavuno, there's been grace. There's been embrace. There's been love. There's been care. But you know what? I always tell the person, you could choose not to confess it, but if you don't, this thing will always hang over your head. You'll be waiting for the day it's leaked by some magazine. And then your career will just be finished. Your life will be finished. And so it's better for it to come from you than from others. Now, if it's Pastor M, God forbid, I would have to confess to the entire Mavuno community. Everyone. And because of my role, I'd probably have to confess to church leaders in the city because I brought shame to the gospel of Christ. I'd have to go to Pastor Oscar and say, this is what I did. And, and let me just tell you guys, sometimes the thought of what could happen is a very good deterrent. <laughs> huh? I'm looking at this hot chicken, I'm thinking it could happen, then I think, wow, 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 the process. I take a plane to Mavuno Kampala, guys. Then I take another one to Zambia, because that's, that, the Lord would expect that of me. Yeah? And, and it would destroy, I've seen churches destroyed because of the sin of the pastor. And so sometimes I think, it's, it, I, I love God, I want to serve him out of grace, but sometimes it's also good to know there are consequences, and you're like, okay. It's like when we were kids, it's like you do this, this is going to happen, okay, sour, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. There's nothing that's worth that. So, as I share this, I want to say that, guys, as far as the welfare of the church is concerned, the purpose of discipline is to protect. We want to protect the fellowship. We want to protect the brother, first of all. When we, when we, when we ask him to leave, our prayer is that he will repent. There's sometimes, even with your own children, and I've talked to some of you who are parents, and you have teenagers who are just crazy, and they've just defied everything you've tried, and I've told you, put them out of your house. Because... At this age, they need to actually be looking after themselves. They're just, they're, they're just taking for granted the grace you're showing them. As a pastor, I've counseled some parents to do that. And you're not throwing them out because you don't love them anymore, but you're, you're putting them into a hostel in college at the hope that they will repent. At the hope that they will repent. And that they will come to appreciate the grace that is in the house. So even when I tell you, by the way, and I've never done this, by the way, I've never gone into that step of saying, please leave the church and don't come back at this point until you've repented. I've never done that. But if I was ever to do it, it would be on the basis of, I pray that this step, I know you'll be angry, you'll go and sink, you're going to talk about churches, you'll go on social media and slam Mavuno, yes, you'll do all that. But my prayer is that you will come round. And ultimately that this step is what will help you come round. So that's my hope. But also I'm praying that the church will also understand that God hates sin. If you remember, we read the book of Acts when Peter and, uh, confronted Ananias and Sapphira. He said, the, the people who collected your husband's body are going to collect yours. I mean, death came. That's how seriously God took sin. Because he knew there's a revival going on and sin can destroy everything I'm doing. So, it's not a threat in that way, but it's almost a sense of sin is defiance against God. And God is the leader. He doesn't take defiance. Guess what happens to Lucifer when he defies God? He's cast out of heaven. Lucifer was excommunicated. But he probably will never return. In fact, he will never return. He's too proud for that. My prayer is that nobody will ever be too proud to accept discipline when it happens. Now, even as I'm sharing this, guys, is because I so love what God is doing in this season. I'm so excited. I've prayed to be alive in a season like this. I have. All my years in ministry, I've prayed for a time like this. And it's happening. I don't know if you can sense God is doing something exciting. You're in Mavuno at the right time. There's something beautiful that God is doing. But I also know that the devil prowls around. He's not asleep. He can feel the power of God in this house. He can feel what is coming. He can feel what is about to be released to all our campuses across the world. He can tell. So he's going to be prowling looking for weaknesses, looking for those places where he can attack us and devour us. And it's good to warn us so that we are ready. Amen? So that even as we are walking, we know what to do. And when we see sin in our midst, we know how to confront it so that nobody is destroyed. 
Whenever you discipline your child, it's not because you want to harm them. When you do it right as a parent, it's because you want to save their lives. And my prayer is, as I'm giving you this information, it's wisdom for you to use, first of all, to save yourself, but then to save your spiritual children, to be better parents in the house of God. Amen. Any parents who are feeling equipped in the house of God? Amen. Amen. So, hey, let's love each other, people. I don't know, it's interesting, Pastor Trevor, you talked about it in the morning, that God just, there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there's an outpouring of love that God is bringing in this season. Amen. That's the word God gave me last year, that we're going to love our church. And by loving the church, I don't mean loving an institution, I mean loving one another. When I say love your church, don't think I'm talking about the brand Mavuno. I'm talking about loving the people around you so much, you're just going to be like, I can't believe I'm so lucky to have people like this around me. There's going to be such love. That testimony that was shared today, I just met somebody because they're from my church. I've sorted out your wedding dress. What? Where does that happen? Have you ever had a story like that anywhere in your life? You just met somebody for the first time and they're like, you're my sister. Pair a wedding dress. She hasn't even started her wedding committee to start fundraising for the wedding. The dress is already sorted by somebody she met in the house of God. That's the kind of love Jesus is bringing into your discipleship groups, guys, into our campuses. And I believe as he brings that, the enemy will try and bring his tricks, but we are forewarned. We are forewarned. God has already spoken to us about it, and we know what to do. Amen. So let's stand up to our feet. Wow. Today I've equipped leaders. Today, today, today's, today was just for leaders. I was giving you just stuff that the leaders of this house will do. You've been entrusted with responsibility. The stuff you've received, hey, take it, ruminate over it plan it to start activating it deal with yourself first before you even start to deal with others because the Lord is raising you up as a leader who will lead many I want to just begin let's, let's just do a little prophecy right now what time is this? it's 15.26 I've got 4 minutes to prophesy yeah, 4 minutes yeah ah. I see the Holy Spirit pouring out a gift of boldness and leadership. Some of you have been afraid as leaders. You've been so shy, so fearful. But I see the Holy Spirit right now pouring out boldness, pouring out a fire, pouring out just so much boldness you will not recognize yourself. I don't know why the picture I have is some, some small person grabbing a big person and shaking them and telling them you must know Jesus. That's the picture I'm getting. You will not be afraid. Your stature will not define you. You're going to be so passionate for Jesus, you will want everyone around him to know. And God is removing your fear. You will never have fear of bosses again. You will not fear any human being. The Lord is your light and your salvation. Whom shall you fear? I see Goliaths falling because of the people in this room. I'm seeing even people not fear, I can, I, in the spirit right now, I'm seeing that you will not fear demons. By the way, demons will run away from you. That's what I'm seeing. That's why the enemy is so scared of what's going on in this room right now. Because the smallest one of you will put demons to flight. Yeah. I see that. I see that impartation of the Holy Spirit coming upon you right now. You will be bold. You will not be intimidated by anyone. You will stand in forums that are international forums. You will speak to people from other nations. You will not be intimidated. I see people here who are not very educated. And the Lord is going to put you in forums with very educated people. And they will marvel at what God is doing. <laughs> Oliver, who was here earlier. Oliver, are you still here? Oli. Oli, you're a model for what this church is becoming. Oliver. Yeah. Prince. You're a model for this church. You know, today morning, when you shared, when you spoke, I was crying. Because I thought, I've never had an eloquent word like that in Mavuno Church. Pastor Milton told me you haven't finished from four. What? What? You have the impartation of the Spirit upon you, sir. You speak better than people who've done master's degrees and PhDs. You don't need anybody. You have Jesus in you. People will look at you like the disciples and they will say, where are they getting these words from? Where is he getting this power from? 
and they will say he has been with Jesus. He's been with Jesus. Yeah. Oliver, you're going to travel to nations. You're going to speak in front of you're going to speak in front of large congregations. This is your blessing right now. Receive it. Yeah. When the invite comes, remind me that I said this word. And that word is not just for Oliver, it's for us. I said it's a model for us. The Lord will put you in places that you cannot even believe you, you belong. You will find yourself in places where you'll be wondering, why me? How did they pick me to speak in this space? You will represent Him. Some of you, by the way, you're so nervous to be in front of people. Public speaking is a thing that gives you nightmares. In Jesus' name, the fear has gone. Yeah. Fear has gone. Fear has gone. <laughs> the Spirit God has given you is not a spirit of fear, but of power. Power. You will speak and people will, will marvel with power. Today, that's what I heard. I heard Oliver speaking with power. Like I was reduced to tears. I was like, I've never heard. I've got eloquent pastors in this house. I've never heard them speak the way he spoke. And I could tell that's the Holy Spirit. Right there, that's the Holy Spirit. That's a blessing for this house right now. And so I just prophesy over you that boldness is coming over you. This year you'll find yourself in conversations where you'll be bold for the gospel. You'll be amazed at the authority God will give you. Demons will flee from you. Even in your sleep, they will not be able to attack you. Even in your dreams, you have victory over the enemy. Some of you have even been troubled by bad nightmares and dreams. In that dream, you'll find yourself rebuking and the demon will flee from you. And so Father, I just speak blessing over your children right now. I thank you because we shall go out with joy and we shall be filled with praise and the mountains and the hills will break forth before us. Lord, this is what you're saying, that the nations will know you because of us. Father God, I pray for love in this church. I pray, I pray for grace in this church. I pray that Lord, the miracle that was given earlier of a wedding dress, is just a symbol, it's a type of what you're going to make this church. That Lord, this church will be so generous Visitors will come and say, I've never seen such love. I've never met such people. And so I bless you, God's people. Oh my goodness. Father God, begin the work of impartation now. Begin the work of impartation now. Begin the work of just pouring. Spiritual transfer. I speak spiritual transfer right now. As you've listened to this word, it is your word. As I've taught you how to be a leader, you will be a leader. In fact, you are a leader right now in Jesus' name. I speak over you spiritual authority. I'm giving you the gift of spiritual authority right now. I'm pouring it over you right now. That is a gift the Lord gave me and I give it to you right now. For the longest time, I was afraid of speaking to people. I always second guess myself. And I prayed for the gift of spiritual authority and the Lord gave it to me. Now I can speak anywhere in this world. I have no fear of anybody. I speak over you right now, my children. This is your gift in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And so Lord, I bless your children right now. I pray for divine opportunities. I pray that even today they will see Kairos moments in conversations. I pray that Lord, between now and tomorrow when we gather again, there will be testimonies that have not happened right now, but they will have happened by tomorrow morning. There will be testimonies in this house. And when we come for prayer, Lord, it will just be a place full of joy. At 5.30 tomorrow, this place will be full of people, full of joy, praying and thanking God for what they've experienced. And Lord Jesus, we're looking forward to tomorrow. Oh Lord, it's going to be epic. <laughs> it's going to be epic. You have some powerful things you're going to do. By the way, tomorrow is going to be a powerful, powerful day. I can tell you right now. And so Lord, I bless your children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and God's people say, Amen. 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 Woo.